Welcome to the Friday Afternoon Sex and Healing Relationship Interactive Pro-Dependence Webinar. That's a mouthful. I'm Debbie McCray. I am a licensed certified sex addiction therapist. I work at Family Strategies Counseling Center in Mesa, Arizona. And my specialty is working with the betrayed partners in the individual therapy setting, as well as running groups that are based upon the prodependence model. So I do have a lot of passion about this and I see it, you know, day in and day out working on the um, level of healing and seeing it change the lives of not only the addict partner, but the betrayed partner. And I also do couples counseling. So I work at bringing couples back together as part of their healing journey as well. Um, today, I'm gonna put a plug in for um, Rob and Kim's book um, that has been written for um, clinical application for therapists, but I also believe it's a great book for anybody who comes to our webinars, anybody who is working on healing their betrayal trauma, their addiction using the prodependence model. There's some great exercises and things to do at the back of the book that are some of the things that I implement even in my own group setting. So I work very closely with Kim Buck. And so I feel like um, a lot of the things I'm gonna share with you today come from here. And then I'm gonna add some of the things that I see in my own um, experience. And what we're gonna talk about today is that question that always comes up at some point in a betrayed partner's healing. And that is, should they remain involved or should they let them go, let the addict partner go? So typically this comes up fairly early on with the betrayed partner wondering what they should do about the long-term you know, um, decision regarding staying in the relationship. And of course, we know that with the prodependence model, we're working on, first of all, getting them stabilized and through that crisis period. So decisions aren't made right away. However, what I'm gonna talk about right now are some of those that have been healing for a while, and I'll share with you some of the situations I see coming up. One that I see oftentimes come up is we've been well into recovery and all of a sudden the betrayed partner discovers that the addict partner has not been honest in their recovery and they have been slipping and acting out. And so that again, not only puts them into a crisis, but oftentimes they already have boundaries put into place as to what they're going to do. So sometimes we have to sit in that moment and figure out the next step, which is going to be ending the relationship. Another thing I see present in my office is difficulties at times for the addict partner in focusing on their own recovery. And instead they seem to focus on the betrayed partner's recovery. So it might show up with them telling the betrayed partner that they're not healing. They're not healing as fast as they are. They don't care as much because they're not moving along, you know, so quickly. And so the betrayed partner starts to feel a whole lot of pressure and begins to be made to feel like there's something wrong with them. And so there's a lot of gaslighting. Another thing I sh see showing up is that the addict partner minimizes the effect the, that the betrayal has had on the betrayed partner, telling the betrayed partner that they have the problem. And so again, a lot of gaslighting. And I'm talking about, this isn't once or twice. I'm talking that this will show up and it is a pattern. As a therapist, I'm always looking for those patterns that are showing up that are unhealthy. So let's just kind of review a little bit about prodependence and, um, the stance that prodependence has on relationships because it is an attachment model. So first of all, prodependence does not mean that you have to stay in the relationship. Prodependence strongly encourages self-preservation on every level. So how that looks for the betrayed partner is they're going to seek out all the information as possible. So they do that by coming into individual therapy. They're joining groups, whether they're a support group or they're a group for healing and recovery. They are going to sit down and have a formal therapeutic disclosure. Hopefully the addict partner is willing to do that. So they're gonna gather all the information that they can because it's going to assist them in evaluating where they're at. And then utilizing this information 
they need to make the appropriate, useful safety plan. So one of the things I work on right away with people coming in to see me in individual therapy is creating safety. That's number one and foremost. So it might look like, first of all, we're working on helping the betrayed partner to get stabilized, emotionally regulated, finding people to turn to for support because their betraying partner may not feel safe. But we're also going to start working on boundaries, things that will keep not only the betrayed partner safe, but in the long run, even the addict partner safe. So prodependence is fully focused on helping the betrayed partner find deeper connection, meaning, and healing through their relationships. But prodependence does not mean that you have to do that at the cost of your own health, your own safety, your own well being, and your own sanity. And sometimes I have to have a really hard conversation, you know, with my clients regarding when I see them really struggling and they've been working for a while, we start to look at what is the situation that's going on. And typically we find that some of those things are being threatened. You know, sometimes the most loving thing to do is to withdraw and to step out of a relationship when safety is the primary concern. And that is really hard for the betrayed partner. It is a struggle. And we'll talk in a moment about what betrayed partners can do. Um, we've talked in previous webinars about the signs that a partner is not in recovery. So I encourage you to go back and look at some of those because we do have to look at the reality of the situation at times. And again, what we're looking for with an addict partner, the betraying partner, is that they are doing consistent recovery over time. And so sometimes we have to get real about whether or not that's happening and if that is somehow threatening the safety of the individual who's been betrayed, okay? Um, this is a really difficult process. I'm not gonna lie, it's very hard. And I find with some of the betrayed partners that it takes time again, that it takes them time to recognize this, time to get the strength, the skills, the tools, the support they need in order to be able to get to that decision. Of course, as a therapist, my goal is to help people repair the disconnection that has occurred as a result of the betrayal, but sometimes there are factors that affect it so adversely that that ability to reattach and reconnect in a healthy way just doesn't happen. So what does that mean for the betrayed partner? That means that sometimes they are in a dilemma of whether they need to stay or they need to leave. And oftentimes we, I just tell my partners, this is a personal choice. I might, as a therapist, be able to see, oh yes, but this, 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 and this is happening. However, that's not my role. I am not in that person's experience. I have to go with what they tell me. And again, safety is the thing that is the most important. Um, the betrayed partner must work with a qualified therapist on this. You just can't go to your friends and get their opinion on what you should do because you're going to get different opinions. Work with somebody who understands addiction and betrayal and what you need to look for regarding what is threatening to safety. Some of the things that I do um, have betrayed partners come in and share is that the addict partner might make little mistakes along the way, and then they really fall apart and question whether or not the relationship is going to last. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about repetitive patterns here, things that are a repetitive situation that threatens safety, and you see that the addict partner is not in recovery. Um, Again, like I said, we have to constantly be evaluating the safety of the betrayed partner. And there is a lot of grief for the betrayed partner as a result of the uncontrolled losses they've experienced. So some of the questions that I have the betrayed partners asking me in session are things like, um, will my, my addict partner ever really care about me and have my back? Um, will my partner ever really be there for me? I just feel like the addiction is so consuming that he or she really doesn't show up for me. Another question is, are they really ever going to understand what they've put me through? Will they really ever understand the depth of pain I've experienced? Another thing they ask is, will I ever trust again? I just can't see myself ever being able to trust. Another question is, um, how can I keep from worrying about them acting out again. Can't get that out of my mind. You know, it's just so difficult. 
And then the other thing that shows up is, you know, I get blamed for their acting out because they say it's how I respond or I react to them. And it's because of the conflict we're in that they're choosing to act out, which is not true. So the bottom line is that each betrayed partner has a different limit. And so we have to look at how much can the betrayed partner handle before they can no longer remain in the relationship because it's not safe. So one of the things we have to do is we've got to get that betrayed partner the right kind of support so that they can have assistance in helping to determine whether or not they can stay. But there are some following things that has to be in place in order for there to be safety. And that is, first of all, the addict partner cannot be abusive on any level. The other thing is the addict partner needs to be seeking help and intervention for themselves. There are times you have to leave and step out of a relationship with the addict because they're not seeking the help and it's no longer safe. Another one is that the addict partner, partner isn't being honest and transparent. Another one is that the addict partner is um, not aware of their addictive problems and they're not willing to fix their problems. So they oftentimes fault the betraying partner. And I see that happening a lot. And the partners I see like that, they'll come in and they feel like they're going crazy. That's what I hear all the time. I feel like I'm going crazy. You know, I feel like I'm doing my recovery work and he keeps telling me I'm not and that he's doing really well and I'm the one who's the problem. Um, another thing is that the addict partners got to take responsibility for their actions and their decisions. Um, the addict partners got to have moments of empathy and compassion, not only for the betrayed partner, but the betrayed partner needs to see them acting that way towards other people like children, family workers, I mean, uh, family members, coworkers. Um, the addict partner is initiating and maintaining their own self-care their own recovery work without being nagged, pushed, prodded into doing the right thing. And then lastly, the addict partners got to be out of the denial and the shame and be accountable for their partner's betrayal. That's a lot of work to do. So oftentimes with the betrayed partners, I remind them that, hey, they're just early in recovery. We've got to give them time. We're working on your healing. That's where the focus is going to be. And we're going to see and just step back, be that compassionate observer, just notice what's happening, step out of judgment as best you can while maintaining healthy boundaries so that you're safe. And let's see how your partner does, because we have to give the recovery time, like I talked about. Partners, however, may choose to leave if certain things aren't in place. And one of the things we are hitting pretty strongly in our groups right now is the fact that. The betrayed partner may not stay in the relationship because it is not physically, emotionally safe to stay in the relationship. And so we're going to be doing, we do some assessments at times just to check and see, you know, if there is any abuse that's taking place. And if there is an addict partner who's continuing in an abuse cycle with the partner or other loved ones, then that's a situation where getting out of that relationship is the best choice. There are times that the betrayed partner no longer wants to help or support the addict, and they do have that right. Um, the betrayed partner may not desire to stay in the relationship. And again, they have that right to make that decision. Um, the addict partner, if they refuse to be honest and transparent, another reason why the betrayed partner may choose to leave. Um, if the addict partner's behaviors continue to create a lot of chaos, if there's a lot of blame, that's going to be a factor, as well as if that addict partner is causing any harm to not only the betrayed partner, family members, people that you care about. Because again, that's a pattern we're looking for that is repetitive, and it indicates that they are not fully in recovery and it's not safe. So, <clears throat> Love hurts at times, it does. And sometimes you have to go. One of the th rules that we have and um, that prodependence espouses is that 
the time to decide whether or not you're going to stay or go is not during the crisis period. I talked about that just briefly earlier. Because remember, when we're in crisis, we're living out of that limbic part of our brain. Our brain's hijacked. So we're in fight, flight, or freeze. And so we can't come to any rational, logical decisions during that time period until we get stabilized. So that's one of the things we need to do. And then of course, I work with the partners on not only getting to that point where they're more stabilized, but then going through and talking about what are their safety needs, right? In all these different areas. And then we work on the boundaries to put into place. Another thing we work on at times is determining what are your bottom lines? What are those things that if they cross this line, you will be out of the relationship. So love is not always enough. There are times where you do have to step out of it. And so with prodependence, it teaches you how to push the addictive relationship aside for survival and stability. So unless there's evident safety issues that require separation, like I said, we want to make sure the crisis period is passed so that we have greater emotional and physical stability. So um, I often see some betrayed partners that appear to be stuck in crisis. And um, even when they're doing their own healing work, they get really stuck. And I find that we're, you know, we're trying to do all the right things. They're implementing some things. And so I try to make them aware of, okay, kind of start keeping a journal about what you're experiencing and why are you stuck? Why do you feel stuck? What does that mean? So they might have um, a lot of symptoms that come up, right? We call them trauma responses, trauma symptoms. So they might have such high levels of anxiety that they never get relief from. So I, I start to work with betrayed partners on, okay, let's figure out what's happening here and why you feel stuck. Um, they might feel helpless. They might feel like they have no power and that it's creating for them Again, so much anxiety or the opposite, they might even shut down because they feel so overwhelmed. Um, we may have sleep issues. So there's insomnia. We may have eating issues. Um, there could be mood swings in the betrayed partner. Panic attacks, I see that a lot. Um, they might be hypervigilant. So they're oversensitive, loud noises. They feel like they're always waiting for the shoe to drop or something really big to happen. They're waiting for the world, their world to blow up. So there can be confusion. Um, I can see, I often see betrayed partners even go into suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation when it gets really bad. And that's where I'm really concerned about safety. And a lot of it's because of what's going on in their relationship with the addict partner. Of course, we talked about there's attachment issues, right? They feel unsafe and secure. They can't move towards their partner at all. And so oftentimes they feel very alone. Um, they have difficulty, like I said, not only with mood swings, but even controlling emotions. And we even work in our healing groups on the anger is going to come up, but we've got to maintain that anger and do something with it, right, in a healthy, productive way and not let it go to rage. And so if I've got a betrayed partner who's going into rage, we have to really work on creating safety, not only for the betrayed partner, but especially for the addict partner. So all of those are signs, just some of the things that keep coming up when somebody is stuck. So what I love about prodependence, and I often say to my clients is, it's okay to not decide what you should do now. Let's just take it one day at a time. And oftentimes that's all we can do. And it's a really great mantra as well. Okay, so what can the betrayed partner do if they're not sure? what they should do in that moment regarding the relationship. So first of all, like I already said, find a qualified therapist who comes at therapy through the prodependence lens, who can help guide and support you during the crisis period and beyond to help you understand attachment, what healthy attachment is, how to create safety, someone who understands betrayal trauma and addiction recovery, and healing from betrayal, okay? Secondly, establish a healthy support network. And by that, I mean, you're either gonna to wanna to get a support group or a healing recovery group that understands how to give you the best type of support. You know, I can go to friends when I'm in crisis 
and maybe my crisis is due to a betrayed partner. And oftentimes their advice and the support they give you, they think they're doing a lot of you know good for you, but in reality, it can add to the trauma you're already experiencing. So that's why one of the first things I do on day one when I do an intake with a betrayed partner is we identify the healthy support that they're going to turn to during especially this crisis period and then beyond. Number three, work with your therapist on establishing your non-negotiable boundaries that would lead to either a therapeutic separation or ending the relationship. So like I said earlier, that is, what are those bottom lines that if you do this, then I have to separate, kind of get my, the ground underneath my feet again, get out of this crisis and figure out the next step, or the relationship is no longer viable and it needs to end, okay? Number four, keep a journal and track your reality. We've talked about this quite a bit here. I'm such a believer in journaling. So first of all, if you feel stuck, start journaling. What are my trauma responses? How often am I having them each day? You know, how am I pulling out of it? How long does it take? Just start really being aware of what's going on internally for you. Own your reality. Again, look at the data. Keep track of the data, right? And with that data, just notice what are your thoughts around that and what emotions is that creating in your system? Because if you've got a partner who's in recovery and the data proves that and you're doing your healing, then you should feel like you can be more grounded. You can kind of pull yourself out of the anxiety and logically think your way through it as you're working on time to go by while your um, addict partner is doing their consistent recovery over time. Um, another thing I love is writing down what your intuition is telling you. I will have partners that say to me, they'll come in and they'll go, I just can't stay regulated. I know he's not in recovery. I just have a feeling every time I go to him, he tells me I'm just crazy. And then come to find out eventually the truth prevails and it's true. Their intuition was correct. So remember your intuition is there to help you kind of feel grounded in what you know or you sense to be true. I believe intuition comes from being in your body, being very mindful, and then we have the ability to kind of connect the dots at times and go, oh, I've got a gut feeling or, oh, I just feel it in my heart or, oh, I just got this idea. Here's what's happening. So pay attention to that. See if there's can some consistency to that. Okay, the other thing I do with clients when they come in, and I encourage them to also go out of session and journal, is all of the reasons for staying and all of the reasons for leaving the relationship. You have to do that. Um, and I know that there are some really big factors that I also have to honor for the betrayed partners. Sometimes it's financial. So if they're staying in a relationship for finance, financial reasons, how can we create safety? The relationship may end up looking different than what they had hoped for. So how might we work with that? Um, there might be children. So how can we not only stay in the relationship if we're choosing to do, to do so because there's children, but how can we create safety for the children as well? So we have to go through because sometimes, you know, those factors, and it's interesting, I will find that over time that if we have an addict who's not in recovery, that oftentimes the pros list will start to decrease and the cons list, the reasons for leaving, begins to increase. And sometimes seeing that shift is enough for the betrayed partner to realize that the relationship isn't safe. Um, you've got to also, the last thing is be honest with yourself. Um, regarding your current situation. So some of the things you need to get real about are, is my relationship abusive? And abuse is not just physical abuse. It can be emotional abuse. 
It can be name calling. It can be gaslighting. It can be minimizing. There's all sorts of ways that emotional abuse can be experienced. Another way is when people tell you that your reality is not your reality. That's also a form of abuse. So again, journaling this is very, very helpful. Um, is somebody mentally abusive? Right? Are they constantly putting you down and telling you're dumb? You know, um, are they criticizing your thoughts and how you say things and all of those types of things, as well as sexually abusive? You know, are they forcing you know sexual um, acts upon you? Are they requiring you to do it so that they'll stay in the relationship? Is there coercion? So be very aware of that. And sometimes you've got to get real, as hard as that is. If you have any question on that, please go into your therapist and ask, because sometimes you're in it, and when we're in it, it's harder to see it. Even I, as a therapist, have to go to my therapist and sometimes talk about it and say it out loud so that I can get some really good, objective, healthy feedback, okay? The next thing, ask yourself, what will happen if things continue on their current trajectory? So have things gotten worse over time? Um, do new problems keep coming up and then are they stacking up? Another one is how is this relationship affecting your children if you have children? Are your kids better off if you stay together or if you separate? Because even little babies and little children can sense tension and anger and all of those distressing emotions. So we have to kind of look at it and go, gosh, would the children be better off if they're in environments where there's no longer any conflict and it feels safe? Okay, the next one, ask yourself, is this an equal partnership, right? Do I feel like I am heard? Do I feel like as a betrayed partner that what I say is honored and respected and valued and heard? Another one to ask, is your partner invested in change in their recovery? If so, how invested are they? So you can kind of go back to the webinar we did a month or so back, which was on the signs that your partner is working their recovery. It's a really good way to kind of see specific you know, actions that should be part of the recovery work. Another thing, to ask yourself is what is the cost for staying? So you've got to look at your, you know, uh, your self-esteem and the effect that it's having on how you value and view yourself. Another one is what is it doing to your mental health, to your physical health? That's another thing you've got to look at. What about your sense of well-being and that sense of peace that you need to have, internal peace? And then are you giving up friends? Are you giving up goals, your career advancements, the parts of life that bring you joy, right? To stay in this relationship that is taking you down to, you know, places where you're not feeling alive and like who you truly are. Um, and then ask yourself, how long are you willing to wait for the um, addict partner to be in recovery or do their recovery? Now, again, my betrayed partners, their minds get a little blown when I say to them, well, three to five years doesn't mean they're going to be, you know, an active addiction for three to five years. It means that as their brain is learning to rewire through their recovery, that you may not see empathy for a bit. But the goal is, is the more they do and the more immersed in their recovery, which will be part of their life moving forward, you're seeing them get better and better and better. So can you wait five years? Can you wait three years? Can you stay in as long as you're seeing improvement? Again, there's going to be mistakes and some backslides. Um, again, boundaries around what is allowed and what is not. But the goal is you're seeing them continue to move forward throughout recovery. And lastly, is your life manageable or is your life unmanageable? So have you as a betrayed partner hit rock bottom? And is it hard to get up from rock bottom? And do you want to continue living like this, right? And so sometimes I will even have my partners go, okay, you know, let's sit down and let's talk about what would life look like if you didn't identify as a betrayed partner? 
right? Or what would life look like for you if your partner was in recovery, right? What would that look like for you? What would that feel like for you? Sometimes we'll do that to kind of help them see maybe some of the progress they've made or they've not made. Sometimes I'm doing that to kind of help them, you know, get a sense of where they're going and what they're trying to look for. But it's really important along the way that as a betrayed partner to understand that your recovery journey and your decision of whether to stay in a relationship or leave a relationship is so unique and individual to you. And you may be in a group, you may talk to other women who are having betrayal trauma and they're choosing to stay or they're choosing to leave. And it's okay if you're choosing to do it differently than them. So I thought that this was just such a great topic to talk about today on the heels of us talking about knowing when your partner's in recovery and not in recovery. And then what do you do, especially if you see that, gosh, all of a sudden you've got to face the fact that maybe that an addict partner isn't doing the work they need to do. And, and great, as always. And um, I love that you pointed out the role of a therapist is to be a guide, a qualified therapist. I can't tell you how many people come, you know, reach out and they're talking about my therapist told me I should leave. And I'm like, in my opinion, a therapist shouldn't be telling you that they can help you come to a conclusion for yourself. And that's basically what you've been saying is like, whatever, whatever is right for you. And you did address too, like there are people that for a variety of reasons, including financial, you know, are unable to do that, but it still can create a healthy, safe boundary, whether it's a therapeutic separation within the house and you know, you're living more as roommates, but that works for your situation, you know, so whatever is right for you, um, I was, I wrote down Kim, because you work with Dr. Kim Buck, as you mentioned with it, and she had said on it when she was doing these, um, if it's a good decision today, it'll be a good decision tomorrow, so you don't have to be reactive, and I, I have talked to a number of partners who have, as soon as they find out, they kick them out, they get, it, I mean, and then they're still like struggling with the betrayal trauma. It, it isn't that getting rid of the addict then magically fixes all of the things, you know, that are caused by betrayal trauma. So, so whether you stay or go, whether uh, you, you still need to do the work and, and getting um, uh, support from a qualified professional and your support network. And I agree with you too, you know, your family and friends, most of them don't understand this stuff and they care about you. And so they are automatically going to go get rid of the bum, you know, move on, you know, you don't deserve this. So, so making sure that you're getting support from places that are able to really help support you in a, in a, in a different way. You've shared Debbie, how you have people in your life that are the, this is my person who's going to tell it to me straight. This is my nurturing person. Like, so, so you find the people that are going to give you what you really need. Trusting your gut. As soon as you started saying, you know, the lip service of like, oh, you know, and, and then the gaslighting. Of, yes. Trust your gut. What you, what you are feeling is far more accurate. And I know, you know, partners that have been gaslighted forever are unable to feel like they can. And that's why having those voices of, of support people of a qualified professional, you know, having trustworthy people who get this stuff, you know, can help, um, can help you can be the sounding board and support for you. I think journaling is so, so important. And I, I, I thought it was interesting when you're talking about, you are, if you're stuck and you start saying, you know, am I able to pull out of this and what, how long is it taking him? You know, and then I was like, well, and what did I do to, you know, like this time I did that and that worked better. Okay. Well then I want to do more of that. So, but it can also be, I think affirming of like, well, it used to take me three hours and now I'm down to 30 minutes. So that's improvement. So, so anything that you can give yourself um, some positive affirmation rather than going, oh, you know, I'm still, you know, struggling with this. I, you know, I think it's those breadcrumbs. I do believe that addicts, it, it's a journey. And, but, but if you're seeing positive, you know, it's not going to be a hundred percent, but if you are seeing positive, that's, that's a good thing. I often too say to partners, you know, if the addict, you know, like people will say, I've been dealing with this for two years. Yeah, like, okay. And there, you know, the addict isn't making any progress. Okay. Can you visually visualize in two years, 
and no judgment. If you're able to see yourself in the exact same situation or worse, because addiction does escalate, are you okay with that? And if you are, and you've got stability and you've got, you know, the support around you, great. You know, if not, then, you know, then what do you need to do? I like how you're talking about, you know, the creating safety. Safety. I, I made a note too, when you said, um, are you an equal partner, you know, uh, but I thought both ways so that as a partner, you are not in a parental role of like, you need to do your recovery work. You need to do, you, you know, it's like, are they, are you both? Uh, in fact, I just reached out to Dr. Stan Tetkin um, because he's got a new book coming out. I'm so excited. But, you know, in his, we do, it's like, are the two of you, and it won't be perfect. It will be really rocky at the beginning, but, but ultimately the goal is that, you know, the two of us against the world, you know, that we're supporting each other. Cause if in that relationship, you know, then, then it's us together doing the benefit of the relationship. But if, you know, if one of you is the parent, one of you is a child, if one of you is, you know, harping on or blaming, like, you know, then it's dysregulated and it's not a healthier, safe relationship. So, and there was one other thing I was going to, oh, the cost for staying. Yes. I, I mean, I, and I think it's the cost of treatment. I, I talk to people about this all the time. Cause they're like, oh, you know, treatment, you know, we can't afford that. And I was like, you know, for a lot of people, they can't afford not to, and it isn't just the financial cost, a divorce costs more. Um, but, but it's really the cost, you know, to yourself, to your, you know, to your self-esteem, to your health betrayed partners, you know, so often are struggling with um, uh, health issues as a result of the, of the, of the chronic um, uh, stress. Interesting that you mentioned suicide too. I, I really, I've run across that more with the addict than the partner. So I, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm also, I was like, oh, well, thank goodness they're, you know, they're working with you so that you're able to help support them. Um, but you know, the depth of, of despair you know, for someone who's, you know, thinking that that is, uh, is a better choice. I just, you know, it, it's, it's a horrible cost. So, but I often, you know, I actually kind of often hear you know, suicidal. I mean, I always wonder if it's just the shame talking. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't take it for granted. I always say you need help immediately. So, um, but, but say, sad, you know, that, that it takes such a toll, but on the other, the flip side of it, and you and I see this all the time, recovery, you know, transforms everything slowly, but surely if, if we're able to do the work and we, you know, consistently a day at a time, you know, keep showing up and doing it, you know, man, you know, my life is great. You know, uh, it has this little, you know, speed bumps and things like that. But, you know, I, I'll take any of these days over, you know, when I was in my acting out, I just, I mean, it's transformative. So. So there's some questions more than three decades married. Today is my third wedding anniversary after D-Day. He's in recovery for more than two years. Today, I have been so sad that I couldn't do self-care barely getting out of bed from depression. Why am I feeling like this? Even though my husband has empathy and is behaving very caring and considerate. He wants us to choose a date to celebrate the new relationship because this one is dead. I am, how much longer um, will my wedding date hurt so much? How can I help myself? I've actually heard of this where people reset, you know, like they, they, re, they reset a date. We have a new relationship. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, I love the fact that you're looking forward to doing that eventually when you're in a place. So mm -hmm. give yourself all the time that you need before you do the reset date and the new date. But this mm -hmm. is something that I talk to my betrayed partners about a lot, especially when we are getting close to like, I will often ask them, okay, things like what was your D-Day? And what, what, when's your anniversary? And what holidays do you feel like have been affected by your partner's addiction? and they're acting out um, because my betrayed partner will know exactly. And anniversaries are consistently the one that they say, I just have such a difficult, difficult time. So I typically work with them on coming up with a plan because you've got to be, first of all, very intentional. You have to make a choice way ahead of time that when that anniversary date comes, here's what I'm going to be doing that day. 
I have even sat down and we have mapped out from hour to hour to hour. Oh, wow. What they're going to yeah. do that day, right? So that they can stay grounded in their body. And I will often encourage the betrayed partner to create a new memory. And I mm. don't necessarily mean the memory needs to be with your betraying partner. I say, if you've got children and family, create a new memory with the family. So I had one um, client, I loved it, when they were coming up on, I can't remember, was their anniversary or the D-Day, right? The Discovery Day. But they took the family, went to Disneyland and had an incredible time. And so now when she thinks of that day, right, she can take the really bad hard part of that day and she can replace it with that positive memory of going to Disneyland. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do. I've had some clients, they don't want to go that big. It's like, let's plan on doing a big family outing that day. Let's go for a hike and let's plan a picnic or let's, right, all of us go to the movies or I mean, sometimes movies are hard because you've got lots of time. Mm-hmm. Yourself, but doing something active and being very intentional. The other thing that you can do, and I even did in my own betrayal trauma, is I put my friends on alert and said, hey, I need you to check in with me that day, or I need to go to lunch with you halfway through the day so I can do a reset. So I'm very, very intentional because it is so easy when we get into that day. And oftentimes a betrayed partner isn't even aware of the fact that emotions are going to come up on what I call some of these important dates in their recovery. And so you've got to have a plan. I learned that the hard way in my own recovery and found that if I was intentional, I planned way ahead. I knew what I was going to do, right? I followed through that I could stay present rather than having to kind of go outside my window of tolerance, which it sounds like that might be what you're experiencing. Um, it sounds to me like your husband being having empathy and being very caring and considerate. It sounds like he would be willing to let you kind of take the lead on this and decide what you need to do. And then you can also ask him to join in. I've got some um, betrayed partners that are like, no, I want him to plan it. I want him to come up with the activity and then come back and tell me what we're going to do because it sp- feels to the betrayed partner, like they really care, you know, because they're trying to do something different this day. So again, we want to take some of the focus off the fact that, oh, this is the day we got married. Look what's happened to the marriage. We're still trying to work out of it. You know, it's not turned out like I wanted it to and try to shift the focus into being very intentional. This kind of falls under the umbrella of self-care and you might have to do self-care for, you know, several years, and that's okay. It's about knowing what your capacity is and what you can handle right now on that day. And as you are working through your healing, hopefully the capacity is going to increase. Um, I know that anniversary dates were really hard for me for a number of years. And now, you know, anniversary date comes and goes and I have forgotten. So there is hope. I want to give you that. Um, I can't tell you exactly how much longer your wedding day is going to hurt, but I can tell you that you'll shorten the amount of pain you have if you will actively intentionally start planning. So even today, if you're going, I never want to have another day like this, then I recommend sit down and journal what you're going to do differently next year while you're sitting right now in your pain. And I know I've had my clients go, what? You want me to write now, write down while I'm hurting so bad about, yeah, learn from it. Decide I'm not going to, I don't want to feel this way next year. So I'm going to try to do this, 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 and this. And just kind of see as you're journaling what ideas and thoughts come to you. So that's some of my ideas. Tammy, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I, I've also heard shoulder days, like the day before, the day after, like they go, oh, I got through this day. And then there's like kind of the residual, like tomorrow. And so, mm-hmm. so I think having a plan that shores up, you know, uh, kind of around the whole, you know, uh, and, and you know and on some level a day is a day and but I get I get that so how do you how do you create a new memory I, you know I, I love all of those ideas I think you know we absolutely can plan and, and it does 
you know, it does soften and, you know, you can create new opportunities and experiences. You're here, like, you know, so great. Like that's, you know, that's a positive. I'm going to, I want you to give yourself a little gold star for being here. You know, even though it's been a struggle day, you know, you're here and asking. So, Mm -hmm. so um, uh, just, but I, but I, you know, I think that what a great idea. Because I have a feeling too, if you go, okay, what do I need to do for next year? And then you journal and you look back and you go, wow, I was in kind of a dark place last year, but look how much different it is this year. I bet you'll see, you know, that next year, because you've planned and you've got, you know, uh, and you've changed, you know, while it doesn't feel and you kind of got hit by a Mack truck again today, you know, I, I, you've been on before. I, you have strength. You've done lots of good work. So um, give yourself some credit. This is just a, a, another one of the speed bumps. So, okay. Next question. Um, I am stuck. He claims for, he claims recovery. That's always bad. But I doubt. So there's your intuition. But I doubt if he has had more than a day of sobriety. He was just acting out a half an hour before this webinar. He has a daughter. I have a son. Both live with us. I have no job and can't afford to move out. Can't go to a shelter because my son is 19. We don't have a spare room. How do we create a therapeutic separation? I have PTSD from him. I've been in crisis for four years. It's very emotionally abusive. I know I need to leave, but can't. Mm. That's a hard one. Um, one of the things that you didn't mention was whether or not you've got somebody you're working with for support, because you're going to need to really shore up your support system. So hopefully you've got a therapist who understands betrayal and that they are there for you to help you problem solve some of these issues, because I'm going to tell you um, our short answer you can go way a lot deeper in some of the ideas I'm going to share with you because there's, you know, every situation is so different and, and your question is a reminder of that. So first of all, feeling stuck. Yes. I imagine you are because you feel like there's no way out. Um, And my guess is if you don't even have an extra bedroom to do a therapeutic separation, you might even have a difficult time finding a safe spot, even in your own home. So that's very, very difficult. The fact that he is still acting out means that he is not in active recovery. He is not doing his recovery like he needs to. So that means you're going to have to be very, very boundaried. So if we're going to do an in-house separation, I have literally sat down with another therapist, both of us are CSATs, with a couple trying to do an in-house therapeutic separation. I'm going to tell you right now, it's very, very difficult. So it's hard to not interact. Um, I've worked with couples who have two stories. So one stays on one story and the other one stays on another story and they switch off um, and they had younger children. It was very hard. I'm going to tell you, it just doesn't work. So another way that some people have done it is that you've got to find a bedroom that's your own. And so that means you might take over the bedroom and your partner who's in recovery or not in recovery might stay on the sofa. That's another option that you have. One of the things I always work with my clients on is sometimes we will just sit down in a situation like yours. That's where I like to go out to where would you like to be and start moving backwards from there, right? And for you, like you said, you don't have a job. You can't afford to move out right now. And I've actually had some of my clients start kind of looking at new careers and just taking a class here and there and getting out of the house to go to class has provided for them a sense of safety, believe it or not, or they've started a hobby so that they are focusing on something else besides, you know, how difficult it is at home. Um, By that, I mean, I've had people that take writing classes because they've always had a love for poetry or writing. Some will do painting classes, some will get into some exercise classes, so they're going out and they're feeling like they're not so stuck in their situation. So they're doing something, I call it to feed your soul, because if we can feed our souls, sometimes when we have a really difficult situation around us, we have more resiliency, we have more capability to manage what we're managing. So if your husband's willing to let you sit down and come up with a plan, right, because he's got to be on board um, and just say, hey, it doesn't feel safe to me. I need to establish some boundaries around safety on this. And you might have to be kind of forward and a little bit, you know, repetitive and firm 
you know, in, in a very grounded way that because you're choosing not to stay in recovery, you're having so many slips. I don't feel safe, right? I love my talking boundary. I talk about it just about every time I'm on here. Share with him what you're seeing. Be very clear in just sharing the data, what you're seeing and what you're hearing, and then tell him what you think about it. What are the stories you're into? You know, where's that taking you? Because there's this internal experiencing you're having that is just feeding that PTSD that you've already got. And then tell him how it's making you feel and then set the boundaries. I need to do a therapeutic separation within our home to create safety for now, right? I don't feel safe. And that means it looks like I'm going to be in the bedroom. You need to sleep on the sofa. Um, maybe put some boundaries around when you're willing to have a conversation, what time of day, what days or day of the week, what you're willing to talk about, right? Putting some boundaries like that into place. Um, it might even be when you eat your meal times, how you eat your meal times. Um, just anything you can think of, or you feel like I need more separateness. I would start with that. But again, I would do it with the help of a qualified therapist who understands how to do an in-house therapeutic separation, because there's so many moving parts. It's really hard because you've got to be very clear on lots of boundaries. And then you've got to maintain those boundaries and hold to those boundaries. So that's where you need the help and the support as well. And, and I'm one of those very practical people. So I'm going like, can he go to the shelter? You know, why, why do you have to leave? You know, and, you, you know, and you have a 19 year old. Is there a friend that your 19 year old can stay with? I mean, like, and it, it, it's easy. Believe me, I get it to get into the, oh my goodness. But, um, you, you know, and I don't know where you live and every state is different. So you need to consult with an attorney and many attorneys will consult at, you know, at, um, uh, you know, at very low or, you know, a, a, a nominal cost, whatever, but, you know, like in many of them, if you're not working, there's, you know, there's spousal support and things. So maybe he needs to leave, you get the house. I, I don't know, but, um, but I, you know, I love, there's lots of free classes, you know, is there some, I mean, lots of even universities have, you know, classes online that you can take, you know, are there some things that you could be doing that would feel positive to you? You know, uh, you know, is is a job an option for you? I, you know, I don't know, but um, it, it, it's tough to feel um, so disempowered. So, are there many, little mini steps you can take where you feel like, okay, you know, this is a positive step forward for me? So, um, but I, you know, I am, you know, I am I'm so sorry, and particularly because I, I was talking to somebody else earlier today about, you know, an addict that is not in recovery, um, it hurts all the, everyone, but, but misses out on, you know, on the good stuff of life too. So, I mean, they're all, they're hurting everyone. They ultimately are losing out themselves too. So it's, it's a terrible situation. They don't understand that, but um, until they get into recovery, but when they do, they go, wow, you know, I wasted so much time and money and everything else you know, being stuck in this little tiny trap, so. Yeah, and let me add just one other thing. I love your practical um, um, suggestions. The other thing too is immerse yourself. If you're stuck, really immerse yourself in, you know, get, get on sex and healing relationship, get in some of their low cost recovery groups, you know, if money is kind of an issue, but even immerse yourself in all of the different webinars and just every day show up for something, because I think you're going to feel more supported by the community. And in that, that's where we get some of our power and our strength back. So that was just one other thing I wanted to add it what you said Tim. yes there's a there's a betrayed partner it's 350 dollars for the entire six-week course that starts in october and free 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 on sex and relationship healing.com you're on the webinars but there's multiple betrayed partner groups every single week um supported by volunteers that you know so please you know and and with other amazing resilient betrayed partners on it too so okay Next question. My wife has asked me to choose either my mother or her. My mother acts like the old version of me, lying, dismissing, and gaslighting all the things I did while I was in my porn addiction. How can I best show up for her with this request? Oh, I got a lot to say about that one. What are your thoughts? 
Okay, well, briefly, mm -mm. Um, obviously boundaries are an issue. So my, my first thought is you have to show up for your wife. That's where your allegiance and that's where your work on attachment needs to occur. And so, of course, it, couples counseling is always good if you guys are in that position, because I really think you need to find somebody who is highly qualified. I love emotionally focused therapy because it really does work on getting us out of the patterns we're in that are creating the conflict. And the other thing is really doing some good boundaries work. Um, I'm glad that you recognize the nice thing is, is you're aware of the fact of your mother's um, behaviors and how you also had those behaviors. So um, that's that awareness is really, really important. Um, one of the books that they're reading in our groups is called um, Set Boundaries, Find Peace. Yes. And I love that book when he's married to mom, Ken Adams. Um, that's another great book to read because he really talks about that a lot in his work. So I would look Ken Adams up and um, listen to any of his webinars, YouTube um, videos, anything like that. Um, he also, I believe, offers some courses along the way. So um, check in with him. But again, it's going back to boundaries and really understanding some of the dynamics and maybe even some of the attachment that's going on there and really working on disconnecting from the pattern you're with your mom and really working on that attachment and creating that secure attachment with your wife. So just off the top of my head, that's some of my thoughts. How about you, Tammy? Yeah, I, and I put it in the chat when he's married to my mom and silently seduced and, and Dr. Ken Adams does great work on, on mother and mesh men and I'm not calling you mother of mesh men but you know when when parental um, guilt and pulls are like that when your wife is telling you to choose there's probably something unhealthy going on with mom. So, so I love that you're in recovery. I love that you're looking at this, but yeah, like your primary relationship is your wife. I'm going to, I'm going to like, mom, isn't going to like that and that's okay. Um, and Dr. Ken does do, um, uh, intensives on mother and mesh men. Um, those can be very helpful in learning to set those boundaries and, you know, and you've got no control over your mom, but you, it's like betrayed partners, you setting a healthy boundary starts to shift things. And, and I have not read this book, set boundaries, find peace, going to uh, look that one up too. But, you know, um, I did a webinar with Gavin Sharp last December, everybody needs healthy boundaries. And it's unfortunate when parents in their own brokenness, you know, parentalize, you know, um, uh, their children and, and, and shift the, the relationship. And so, so I agree with Debbie, you know, your wife, um, and healthy boundaries, you know, with, with mom, uh, will be transformative, um, to you and, and your relationship with your wife too, you know, and ultimately, you know, healthier for mom too, you know, so. Yeah. And what I love about including a therapist in on this is that there is some accountability, also some assistance in how to word boundaries, what a healthy boundary mm -hmm. looks like, because sometimes it's very difficult when you've been in it for so many years, like with a parent or whoever it is, and you're trying to step out of it and do it differently. It's very, very difficult. I remember years ago working with my own therapist on redefining boundaries with parents, right? And for me, I just didn't know where to start, how to do it, how to say it. I couldn't even understand what was really healthy. And so it was so helpful to have somebody that was not only there telling me, well, this is how healthy attachment is. This is how you should do it now that you're married and you're, you know, in relationship with somebody else, right? You're, it's different. You're emancipated. You're no longer part of, you know, the dynamic with the parent, the dynamic is between you and your partner. So I love the accountability. I love the guidance. So this would be a great thing to go into a therapist's office and work on together. I think your wife would feel so supported if you recommended that and said, you're willing to do that. And so I think that's a great starting point in offering that to her. And on, I don't have time to put it, but on sexandrelationshiphealing.com under the resource tab, 
um, John Taylor did a series of two webinars on mother and mesh men. He's, he's trained with Dr. Uh, Ken Adams and he's, he's done some, but he did a series of two webinars. So you'll find them under the resource tab or previously recorded. They were a while ago. So go to the bottom and, and find more, but those will be helpful for you as well. But, and, and, you know, whatever you want to call it, if you just look at it as this is going to help me set healthy boundaries with, with my parents, you know, I mean, it, it, it happens with daughters and moms, you know, uh, my, you know, father, I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter, but these are healthy boundaries for you know, other people so that I can, my connection with my spouse can, you know, can be in a much healthier place so so hopefully that's all helpful okay we are out of time great job debbie thank you all for joining us um we'll we'll see you again in a few weeks um let's see matt wheeler will be on next week uh so thanks everybody bye, -bye. bye, -bye.